this episode of The Exchange, I speak to Emma Holton about the importance of consent and online privacy, and Claire McGlynn gives some helpful advice on what to do if you find that you're a victim of revenge porn. Claire, it's great to have you on The Exchange today. On this episode, we're going to be discussing revenge porn. What is revenge porn and why do you prefer not to use this particular term? So when we talk about revenge porn, people usually are talking about where a nude or sexual image has been shared without someone's consent or agreement. Often they're shared amongst friends, Facebook, WhatsApp, sometimes they're uploaded to um, porn sites on the internet. Many of us prefer not to use that term and a lot of victims don't like the term revenge porn because it, it tends to blame the victims as if they've done something wrong and it's never someone's fault when someone shared an image without their consent. So many of us use the term image-based sexual abuse because many victims say they feel as if they've been abused, their trust has been abused, you know, their uh, privacy has been abused. And so the term image-based sexual abuse covers all taking or sharing of sexual or nude images without consent. So when we are talking about image-based sexual abuse, what is the law currently and how does that protect people? So it's a criminal offence if you take or share a sexual image of someone without their consent and agreement. So it's really quite clear that this is wrong conduct and if you want to take an image of someone or you want to share that image, you must get their agreement before doing so. Equally, if someone has taken an image and you didn't know they were doing it and they shared it without your agreement, it's a criminal offence and it's clearly wrong conduct. It's difficult to have a conversation about image-based sexual abuse without talking about the sharing of nude images or videos. What is the law when it comes to sharing needs and why is it important for us to be aware of this? If you're taking or sharing a nude image, including a selfie, it might be that you are committing a criminal offence. But more importantly, I think we need to just realise that the criminal law is actually just telling us about what we in society think is right and wrong. And in society, what we're saying is it's wrong to take or share an image of someone without their consent and agreement. And I think that's what we need to to focus on. Hi, Emma. Hello, thank you for having me. Not at all, thanks for calling all the way from Copenhagen today. No problem. Emma, I don't know many people who are as brave as you are when it comes to speaking out against image-based sexual abuse. Your life changed in a moment at the age of 20. I wonder if you could just talk me through what happened. Yeah, so I woke up um, in 2011 in the fall um, and couldn't enter my Facebook and email. um, And I didn't understand why. And once I got in there, I very quickly understood that, you know, something had happened. I had gotten so many messages from strangers. I had no idea what was going on. Many of them were extremely abusive and, and I was very confused as to why I was receiving this. But in one of the emails, I found, I found a link to a site that um, made it clear that someone had gained access to my email in the night while I was sleeping and taken my address, my phone number, um, some naked pictures that I had sent to a boyfriend three years prior. Um, my entire Facebook friends list, where I was studying, where I was working, uh, pictures of all my social media, uh, and uploaded it together with kind of an encouragement to abuse me. Um, and, and I don't know who did this to me. Yeah, that's the very simple, simple story of what happened to me. So this is an experience that unfortunately quite a few people will relate to. Um, what was your initial reaction and how did you feel when you realized what had happened? I think I had an initial reaction of, of, of a loss of control and a humiliation, but I also thought, okay, this is going to be some terrible 24 hours and then they'll find another girl and it'll go away and I won't have to ever tell anybody that this has happened. But as kind of the months progressed, it started dawning on me that, you know, it doesn't go away. You know, any month or every two months, they would get re-uploaded somewhere new and it would be an entire new thing all over again. And I think when that happened, that was when I started to, to think that 
this is so much bigger than I understand and I, I need to understand better what is going on because this is so unbelievable. How did your family and friends respond to this? Did they support you? I think I was lucky. I know that many victims or potential victims fear judgment from their parents. Um, I luckily didn't experience that. But I, I did experience in the friend group a sense that I had become kind of a little bit of a toxic person. Um, my close friends was fine. I think for me, the issue was more the people who are, you know, my friends, friends who don't necessarily know me personally that well, but know who I am for them. You know, that was the only thing they knew about me. That was my identity to them. And that felt incredibly, incredibly violent because I felt like I had been robbed of the right to shape my own identity and shape my image in the world mm -hmm. so they'll be like oh but you know okay so someone has seen your breast so what that's what they try to say when they try to be nice right it doesn't matter and I'm like it matters to me being a victim of this crime is explaining exactly to people why it is you're feeling so much pain because people think you're feeling pain because you're ashamed um, and that's not really it you're feeling pain because other people are shaming you <laughs> Mm. it's other people's reactions that are the problem and how easy was it to I suppose find these images and get rid of them from the internet oh completely impossible there I think they're still pretty easy to find I haven't been looking for them for a while but uh, I have completely given up uh, succeeding in having them removed I think it has gotten a bit better as this has gotten more attention um, I think sites hosting these types of pictures are struggling more now than they were 10 years ago but for many, many years, this was the first thing that came up when you were Googling me. If I were to go and try to remove these pictures, it would be a full-time job. It's against the law in the UK to share nude images or videos under the age of 18. How do you think young people are protected by this law? In Denmark, this has been illegal since the 70s. And that didn't really save me from experiencing incredible pain, humiliation, from people supporting my perpetrators, from people sharing the pictures themselves. And I also think that as a society, we tend to have a lot of empathy with uh, violators, but not a lot of empathy with victims. As long as this type of crime has the tremendous emotional effects that it does, we need to have a system that reflects the pain that's caused. So while a law is good, we need social change as well to support the law. Otherwise, a law like that is, is not at all as powerful as it should be. What should you do if somebody is threatening to share a nude picture or video of you? What I would hope is if someone's threatening you, you feel able to talk about that with a good trusted friend or a trusted adult because we can take steps to uh, speak to that person who's threatening you. And if you don't feel that there's a friend or someone in school or another trusted adult, there is the Revenge Porn Helpline and they would be able to talk to you and talk you through your options of what you might choose to do. If you see or hear of someone experiencing image-based sexual abuse, to help prevent further suffering to the victim, what should you do? So if someone tells you that they're going through this or someone's threatening them, the most important first step, I think, is to understand what they're going through. It's not their fault. They're not responsible for this and that it can be very painful and very harmful. So don't um, try and dismiss the conduct um, or don't try and minimise it. Then it's about talking to them about their options. Is there an adult they feel they could speak to? Are they willing and able to speak to the revenge porn helpline? Perhaps it's sufficiently serious they want to go to the police. So it's talking through those options with them because they need to choose what's best for them and what's right for them. But being there and understanding what they're going through is going to be absolutely critical. Claire, thank you so much for sharing um, just some of the legal aspect of this topic. Thank you very much. It's a really important topic. Thank you for inviting me. So why do you think that consent should be at the heart of this conversation? What was interesting when this happened to me was that a lot of people tended to say to me, oh, you know, um, I understand that you're ashamed that people have seen your breasts or I understand that you're ashamed that people have seen these pictures. And I would be like, 
no, 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 that, that's not it at all. I, I, what has pained me is that people have violated my consent. So when I started thinking about doing activism on this, on this topic, I was like, this is what I need to explain, the consent violation, that the actual image and what it contains is not the important thing. The important thing is the way in which it has been distributed without my saying yes to it. Uh, nudity and sexuality isn't dangerous in and of itself. That's fine, and it's not shameful. There's nothing wrong with it. But once nudity and sexuality is taken without consent, that is really dangerous. And that's why I center consent in everything I do, because that makes sure that we have privacy, ways of th thinking and talking about privacy that includes everybody, no matter how you know liberated you are. Um, and that's super, super important to me. Surviving and then recovering from image-based sexual abuse must be really difficult. How have you fought back? I don't know that I've recovered. Um, I think that would be a strong word to use. I think I am just like a lot of people who've had traumatic experiences. Obviously, I'm not alone. Um, you find a way to live with it um, and to make some sense of it. As soon as you start thinking about, okay, this happens to so many people all around the world all the time. I'm one of these victims. What does this say about my society, my culture? How can I start talking about this on a bigger level? You also gain some power over the situation because you get to tell the story, right? And I think what was so painful for me was that I felt that everyone else had hijacked my name and my body and my face to tell a story that I didn't agree with. And for me, becoming an activist was very much about saying, I see this as a story about sexism. I see it as a story about privacy. And as soon as I, I started thinking in that way, I, I started feeling better because I was doing something. And, and that has been very, very important to me to look at this from a political angle and an activist angle. Because if I were to, you know, wake up every morning and think about that, that this has happened to me and it will keep happening to me for the rest of my life, I'd never get out of bed. There are going to be people in the room who are watching this who have experienced something similar to me and, and they will feel probably hit by what I'm saying. But I actually want the people who feel completely removed from this story to be more interested in it. Because you're the one who can really make a difference to a person like me. You can radically change the experience for me of going to a party or going to a job interview. Um, and I need you to do that for me to just have a regular life. So there's a lot of power in not being a victim as well to make a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's very important for us who are victims because sometimes we're also just grieving. Yeah. And uh, we need some help. Emma, thank you. Thank you.